In Until Dawn, before you see the Wendigo, you get to see through its eyes and it looks like this. What would it take to recreate this effect? What if we wanted it for video or real time on a webcam? And could this effect be made more realistic? In this video, I'll explain how I rewrote this shader based on how we actually see. When you first sit down to think about this, you might say, okay, we see a 3D world where things are moving. How do we translate that motion into something a computer understands? Let's back up for a second. In each of our eyes, we have a retina. It's like a curved screen lining the back of the eye made of light sensitive cells. Light from the world comes into the eye and hits the screen of cells. Projecting an image based on different amounts of brightness hitting different parts of the retina. Because the retina is like a screen or wall, the image created is 2D. So technically, a single eye sees in 2D and any motion will appear to be 2D as well. This is the idea behind optical flow, a concept introduced by psychologist James J. Gibson, and this intuition will make motion much easier to explain to our computer. So now we're thinking in 2D, but how can a shader know when we're looking at something and that it's moving and where it's moving? Here's where we can start to simplify. Let's make this world only grayscale so we just have brightness. We have an object and that object is made up of parts or points and each point has a certain brightness. If we assume nothing in our world can suddenly get darker or lighter, then we know the brightness of a point on an object won't change randomly. That lets us use brightness as an identifier or name for a part of an object. If the object moves, then all its points move and all of their brightness moves with them. So for any position x, y at any time t, we're seeing the brightness i of x, y, t of some point on some object in the 2D world. If that brightness of a point moves from x, y at time t to x plus u, y plus v at time t plus 1, then we can say the brightness moved with velocity uv, which means the point did also, and so did the object. So now, even without knowing what those objects are, we have an equation for movement of all objects in our world. It's called the brightness constancy constraint of optical flow. So we formalize how movement works in our 2D world in terms of brightness, but we want to find a uv, and that equation doesn't let us do that. How can we turn this equation into something that has u and v in the form that we can actually solve for? For a large variety of functions, you can approximate them around a certain point using an infinite sum of their derivatives. This is called a Taylor series. It's up to the user then to decide how much accuracy they need and cut off derivatives that aren't necessary. If we assume objects move at most one pixel per frame, then the first derivatives alone are enough to approximate the function. It's like how the Earth looks flat from right at the ground level. After some rewriting and cancellations of this series, we end up with this linear equation. Clearly the u and v are accessible now. The other derivatives are the first derivatives or slopes or differences in brightness between two pixels horizontally, vertically, and between frames. We can find those derivatives and this is what it looks like when we color a shader with them as the RGB values. We're close to done with this, but we have one equation and two unknowns. It's not that we can't solve it, we can. The problem is that for any choice of u, there is a v, so we have a line of infinite many solutions. So what we want to do is find more equations with the same uv. We can assume that motion in the world will be about the same anywhere in a small neighborhood around a pixel. That means we can sample each neighbor and get a list of linear equations with the same uv unknowns. Now we have a bunch of lines that all intersect somewhere. Unless they all intersect at the same spot, we still won't have a solution, but we don't need an exact solution. If we can find a uv point that minimizes the distance between all the lines, it will give us the best possible approximation. This is done using the least squares method. It uses a standard equation called a normal equation with a normal matrix that looks like this. I basically calculate the sums in a for loop and then put its inverse on the other side and solve. The resulting solution is the final motion vector and this is what it looks like when all pixels are colored by the motion of the 2D points they represent. This whole method we've built up to is called the Lucas Kanade method and I have to thank the schwa on Shader Toy for their example and a link to the Wikipedia article. There is a lot of noise coming from the webcam, and so the shader is treating it as small, random motions. 
If I tried to use this directly as the basis for an Until Dawn shader, it would look bad. So how can we reduce the noise? We can blend frames using the time derivative, that way the noise that changes randomly each frame will cancel out. More importantly though, this shader is actually giving us a lot of false information. Imagine staring at a flat wall. No, I mean really flat. No texture at all. Someone tells you the wall is moving, either left or right. You can't tell which way it's moving because the wall has no texture. Our normal matrix has the same problem. It depends on the variety of the gradients in each cell of the neighborhood to create a linear system of equations with a lot of information. When the gradient is mostly flat, it doesn't have enough information to get a good motion vector, so the vectors they give us are unreliable, and we should discard them. So how can we figure out when a vector is unreliable? For any 2x2 two two matrix, we can easily find the trace of the matrix and the determinant of the matrix, and we can use the trace and the determinant to find the eigenvalues of the matrix. If one or both of the eigenvalues are close to zero, that means the matrix doesn't have enough information to reliably compute optical flow. So for pixels where this happens, we should set their motion vectors to zero. That helps reduce the noise a lot, but now we only have the edges around my face. That still wouldn't make a good until done effect. We can increase the neighborhood size, which basically spreads the motion vectors over a larger area, but there is a much better solution, and to get to that, we can go through data moshing. The data moshing effect is based on a type of video compression. Instead of storing each frame of image data, you can compress the video by sometimes only storing the motion vectors of where points in the 2D world have moved. Then when displaying it, just use the motion vectors to move those points to the pixels they're supposed to be at. Data moshing is a type of data corruption where frames are lost but the motion vectors keep trying to move things. I first learned about data moshing from Jam2Go's video on the topic. My shader example is just a quick experiment to prove it can work. I store one frame, and then for every other frame, I still do check the new frames, but I only use their motion to change where I access data from that first frame. It doesn't look exactly like what I've seen online, but the idea of moving where you access image data will help us improve the Lucas Canade method. That was a lot of math, but I've only just scratched the surface on those topics. If you want a deeper understanding of the Taylor series or the least squares method, you should check out today's sponsor Brilliant. Brilliant is a learning platform based on the understanding that we learn best by doing. They have thousands of interactive lessons on math, data analysis, AI, and programming. Since I started using Brilliant, I found it very easy to show up and do a few minutes a day. This let me deepen my understanding of topics I needed for this project without getting lost in the weeds. Brilliant has a comprehensive catalog of math courses that range from beginner to advanced. In fact, all of the math in this video, Taylor series, determinants, traces, eigenvalues, and the least squares method can be found in the calculus and linear algebra sections of the foundational math course. Through building formulas yourself and using visual spatial problem solving strategies, you will develop an intuition for the most important and useful concepts. Then you get to use the knowledge you've built to solve real world problems. To try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash use of 28 or scan the QR code on screen. Or you can click the link in the description. You'll also get 20% off on an annual premium subscription when you sign up. Thank you Brilliant for sponsoring this video. To improve our basic Lucas Canade method, we can use a resolution pyramid. How it works is, we first run the algorithm at a low resolution to get motion vectors for the big movements. Then we run it at a higher resolution, but using the motion of the lower resolution to sample the higher resolution. So like with data moshing, we pull from pixels where something came from into the pixel where it's going. Then when we run the Lucas Canade method at this higher resolution, after moving things, it's like we've corrected for the big movements at the lower resolution and are now just finding the smaller, more detailed movements. Now, if we want a third layer at an even higher resolution, we should add the smaller motion vector we just found at layer two to the large motion vector from layer one, and then use the summed vector to correct for layer one and two when we do our layer three. So we are building something like a motion vector fractal that gets more accurate over time as we move up the pyramid. The result is we have more than just edges now and the motion vectors seem more accurate as well. 
So we've done a lot of work, let's explore what this can do for a minute. This thing can highlight moving shadows and reflections, which is more realistic. The same way a cat can react to a shadow or a reflection or a laser pointer, I would expect a Wendigo to at least notice a moving shadow or a reflection. So those are some important details that a game engine might not give you. Beyond that, the shader lights up only what parts of you are moving and to the extent that you're moving. It can also pick up small movements like me swallowing. There are two issues I haven't solved. If we move the camera, everything gets lit up. That's why I didn't bother showing any reshade footage. The other issue for a webcam is if the camera changes focus or adjusts brightness dynamically, then it can show up as movement when it's not. To turn this into the Wendigo vision effect from Until Dawn, it's mostly realizing that besides the enhanced motion detection, the Wendigo actually has really bad vision. The Wendigo is colorblind, but in this very specific way, seeing only shades of orange. So we can set everything to grayscale and multiply by some orange. Next, the Wendigo seems to be nearsighted, but for a webcam, we don't have depth. So I've settled for making everything blurry, but putting the final motion highlighting effect on top so it's still clear. I also found a screen-spaced lens flare implementation on John Chapman's blog, you might argue that the lens flare is something everything in Until Dawn has and isn't specific to the Wendigo, but it makes sense for Wendigos to have lens flare since it's common for people to also see them when they have vision issues. And there you have it, a Wendigo shader you can use in a video or real time on a webcam. It's not the same as the original. With the game engine, you can color every triangle with some linearly interpolated color and you just can't do that with this method since there are no polygons, so it's not as smooth. The plus side for realism is the Wendigo can now see movement of shadows and reflections. As far as I know, Wendigos in Until Dawn are as smart as they were as humans, they just only care about eating people now. So if they could see a reflection or a shadow, they would likely investigate where it was coming from. Let me know what sort of game or video this style of motion vectors could be useful for, and uh, do you have any suggestions for improving this? or any other thoughts, I look forward to the discussions in the comments. I hope you enjoyed this video and I'll see you in the next one.